production of the Mississippi State University Extension Service. Today on Farm Week, the American Farm Bureau will have a new president starting in January. Mississippi farmers planted more GMO soybeans than any other state in 2015. In the food factor, try some vegetables on the grill for some new flavor. In Southern Gardening, you'll be amazed by these plants with dark foliage and bright flowers. In the markets, optimism for cash cattle prices despite weaker demand and higher corn. While China remains the wild card as far as the cotton trade is concerned. In the feature segment, the outgoing outstanding logger of the year for Mississippi. Jason Smith of Brookhaven may be young, but he's known for working like someone who's been in the business a long time. People see a logging job and they say, oh, look how bad that looks. But if they go by a field, a field that's being farmed, they, they don't think no different. We own the same conditions as a farmer. Ours is in a 30-year rotation instead of a one-year rotation. Good day everyone, I'm Leighton Spann. And I'm Artis Ford, welcome to Farm Week. The leader of our nation's largest organization supporting farmers and rural America is about to step down from his post. Leighton Bob Stallman of Texas announced Tuesday that he will not run for a ninth term as president of the American Farm Bureau Federation. Stallman said that he will not seek re-election at the organization's annual meeting in January. The Columbia, Texas cattle and rice farmer has served for almost 16 years as American Farm Bureau president. Stallman has been elected eight times. Prior to that, Stallman served six years as the president of the Texas Farm Bureau. A new American Farm Bureau president will be elected in January at the organization's 97th annual meeting. Genetically engineered crops are the source of a lot of controversy, but United States farmers apparently aren't afraid to plant them. When it comes to soybeans, Mississippi farmers, in fact, lead the nation. The latest report was released by the U.S. Department of Agriculture last week. 94% of the nation's soybean crop is genetically engineered. Mississippi is the highest state with 99% of its soybean acreage planted with GMOs. Arkansas, the only other southern state broken out in the report, planted 97% of its soybean acreage to GMO varieties. The USDA says 92% of the corn planted in the U.S. is genetically modified. Now that's down 1% from last year's high of 93%. North Dakota and South Dakota led the way with 97% of their corn being GMO varieties. Turning to cotton, 94% of the nation's acreage is planted with genetically engineered plants. 99% of Mississippi's cotton is genetically engineered. The breakdown for other southern states looks like this. Alabama, 97%. Arkansas, 99%. Louisiana, 99%. And Tennessee, 99%. The lowest was California, 71%. An attractive online presence is a key asset if a rural town is working to improve its economy through tourism. At Mississippi State University Extension's Rural Tourism Workshop, participants learned how to enhance their town's assets and create an interactive online experience for potential visitors. Farm Week's Amy Taylor reports from West Point. Every town has a story to tell. Small towns can use their history and culture, along with other assets, to draw visitors and stimulate local economy. Rachel Carter, Community Development Specialist with Mississippi State University Extension, says the Rural Tourism Workshop revealed how to create successful tourism hotspots. It's all about training people in rural communities on how to basically create an experience and then cost effectively sell that experience using social media, using apps, targeting that, those folks that are searching for um, tourism attractions on their iPhones, and it's all about creating virtual tours, and we actually today on our bus tour created a virtual tour, and the participants in the workshop actually participated in that and got to see hands-on how to work with a videographer and how to identify what attractions could be put into a tour. 
Carter says workshop participants received helpful tips while touring various Mississippi attractions. One thing that um, I want people to remember is that authenticity is very important. It's very important to um, preserve any type of history that you can in your small towns because what that does is it preserves the culture of the town and the town's identity and people really feel like that creates a sense of place and it makes their home special. It was all about interacting and creating a rural tourism package. A lot of communities have lots of different things that people might want to come and see but maybe they don't have a way that makes it easy for a potential visitor to access it and figure out how does this fit together, how do I plan my day. Additionally, Carter says it's essential to be sure information online is accurate and updated regularly. From Northeast Mississippi, I'm Amy Taylor reporting. Meat is a standard at most backyard cookouts, but don't be afraid to try something new on the grill. In this week's episode of The Food Factor, Natasha Haynes with Mississippi State University Extension says the grill can impart some great flavor to vegetables. Summertime is great for grilling out, but you don't have to limit your cookouts to just your favorite meats. It's time to grill some veggies. To boost the flavor of grilled vegetables, add a variety of seasonings and spices, or try marinating for 15 minutes before grilling. Slices of eggplants are delicious when marinated in balsamic vinegar, olive oil, garlic, and basil. Or try adding a spoonful of pesto onto grilled tomato halves and dusting with a thin layer of oregano. Mmm. Smaller vegetables, such as peppers, mushrooms, and zucchini, should be cut into pieces and placed in an aluminum foil packet or a vegetable grilling basket. For larger veggies, such as corn on the cob and asparagus, try cooking them directly on the grill. Just remember, to soak the corn in water first. Grilling vegetables not only adds variety, but it's a healthy way to keep you fit, trim, and looking good. <laughs> it's time to make healthy food a factor in your life. Grilled vegetables can dry out during cooking, so toss them with some cooking oil before grilling, and don't use too much oil, however. It can cause some flare-ups if it drips off. Most gardeners prefer color when they're looking for a new plant. In this week's Southern Gardening segment, Extension Horticulturist Dr. Gary Bogman tells us how plants with dark foliage can provide an attractive but different look. I've always been a fan of landscape and garden plants that have dark foliage that proudly shows off colorful flowers and fruit. Let's take a look at some of my garden must-haves. I'm really impressed with these new dahlias and their dark chocolatey brown foliage. Delightful sultry scarlet produces season-long semi-double scarlet red flowers that make a seductive combination with the almost black foliage. Delightful Georgia peach has deep blackish green foliage that shows off the warm apricot colored semi-double flowers. Both of these plants have strong branching and will grow 16 to 24 inches tall when grown in the full sun. But if you're looking for a bigger plant, then the Mystic Illusion Dahlia is a must-have. This plant produces loads of star-shaped, bright lemony yellow flowers that seem to be leaping off the burgundy black foliage. A tip for growing dahlias is to be patient and wait to plant in the spring at the same time as your tomatoes. Another group of landscape plants I like with dark foliage are ornamental peppers. One selection that is definitely a garden blessing and not a curse is black pearl. The round marble-sized fruits start off as shiny black and transition to bright red. Another dark-leaved All-America selection from 2012 is black olive which has a nice upright habit and produces small clusters of black purple fruit along the stems that also mature to bright red. So go ahead and try some plants with dark, dark foliage in your landscape. I'm horticulturist Gary Bachman, and I'll see you next time on Southern Gardening. 
Leighton Gary says, keep in mind if you plant ornamental peppers that uh, the fruit is edible, but it is quite hot. <laughs> In our feature segment today, should we think of a tree farm the same as a row crop farm? Well, that's what Jason Smith says, and he's the present Mississippi Outstanding Logger of the Year. Time now for the markets with Leighton, and the uh, Russian market remains closed to U.S. farm goods. That has happened. Russian President Putin has indeed extended the existing ban on imports from the West for a year. Also ahead, these stories in this market segment as we enter this, the last half of July. There is optimism in some quarters about the potential of cash cattle prices. Cotton prices are likely to remain stable. And there were no real surprises in the latest round of corn and soybean numbers out of the USDA. We begin with the threat to Mississippi's chicken and egg industry, a threat from avian flu that apparently is closer to reality, according to the USDA. The nation's top veterinarian, Dr. John Clifford, says the Animal and Plant Health Inspection Service is preparing now for that virus to occur all across the country this fall. That would include the Mid-South and Southeast. Feeder cattle prices traded sharply higher at midweek. Analysts have noted a lot of difference lately, though, between cash prices and the board as far as this livestock market. Trader Walt Hackney says he's hearing a lot of optimism about the direction of the cash cattle market. I have cattle feeders today that are willing buyers of feeder cattle at this market indicating that we very easily are going to see a dollar sixty fed cattle again in the cash markets soon. They're also indicative of the fact that we're going to see instead of the two forty and fifty dollars per hundred of these feeder calves for October delivery they're still very convinced that that could, could easily go to $300. Time to break for the trivia quiz on Farm Week. Our topic concerns horses and something a farrier would know about. Here is the quiz question. How many nails are usually put into a horseshoe? Is the answer A, 4, B, 6, C, 8, or D, 10 nails? You'll find out in a few more minutes. We're going to pause for a short break on Farm Week. Coming up, we'll look at the calendar and the rest of the markets. Leighton Span reports on the cotton market and what's ahead for corn and soybeans. In the feature segment today, the outgoing Mississippi Logger of the Year says tree farming should be treated like traditional farming. Why farmers markets? Why come here? Well, there's no doubt it tastes better. And heck, it's better for you too. Everywhere you look is great food, healthy food. It's just a healthier choice and we like that it supports our community. The reason I come is because you just can't find this quality anywhere else. Hooray Farmers Market! Now before we get back to the markets, let's look at the farm week calendar. Rice farmers and consultants are urged to participate in the Rice Growers Meeting and Field Day on Thursday. July 30th at Stoneville. The event starts at noon with lunch at the CAP Center. At 1 p.m., the Mississippi Farm Bureau will host its summer rice meeting. The field day starts at 3.30 p.m. with a field tour of Stoneville's research plots. Herbicide technologies, rice seed treatments, insects, and other topics will be covered. Looking ahead into the fall, Mississippi's second Master Naturalist course will take place in eight weeks from September 3rd to October 21st. Participants will meet once a week from 9 a.m. to 3 p.m. The cost is $200. The location is Mississippi State University's Coastal R&E Center on Pops Ferry Road in Biloxi. But you will be out in the field a lot as well as you learn about the Coastal Plains Natural Habitat. It's sponsored by Mississippi State University Extension and the Mississippi-Alabama Sea Grant Consortium. Go to our Farm Week website at farmweek.msucares.com for information on these and other events. Now check out this week's Farm Week Snapshot. Earlier this month, Boll Weevil Management and the Farm Bureau Cotton Commodity Committee all met in Grenada. 
Ag Economist OA Cleveland told that group cotton seems to have built in a low price of around 65 cents. Delta Farm Press reports that Cleveland thinks there may be bumps up to 70 cents along the way. DuPont Pioneer analyst Virgil Robinson, meanwhile, says prices look stable to him and supplies worldwide are adequate. If we were all concerned uh, about the El Nino effect in, in a couple of regions, cotton growing regions, one being India, the second being Australia, the Indian monsoon through the month of June, believe it or not, was at or above normal. So the Indians, I think, are on track to produce another large crop of cotton. Um, the Chinese probably are the wild card here. As it has been decided, they will try and reduce the huge in-country reserve that they currently own. Now the problem is their ownership price is pretty high in relationship to today's, to today's international market. So it is conceivable they pass that offering and look to international suppliers because of the price differential. The July 10th monthly crop and supply demand update from the government lacked the fireworks of the June 30th acreage report as far as the corn and soybean markets. Extension Ag Economist Brian Williams says the weather the next few weeks will likely have a lot to do with future price action in the grains and oil seeds. Well, Brian, the USDA report showed tighter stocks of old crop corn. How much tighter are we talking about? It did. We saw a, a pretty big uh, decrease in the, in the ending stocks for last year's uh, corn crop. Uh, 97 million bushels lower, and that was lower than what expectation was. Um, but what we saw is a 50 million bushel increase in feed use, uh, 25 million uh, bushel increase in ethanol use, and then another 25 million for exports. And then we saw imports uh, come up a little bit to kind of make up that difference. So is this change going to prop up prices, make them a little bit stronger for as far as corn? Well, uh, probably not too much. It, it was a little bit bullish, but overall it was still well within kind of what the expectations were for analysts. What about new crop corn? What, what kind of ending stocks are they projecting on that? Well, we saw the lower ending stocks. First of all, we had the carryover was lower from, from last year. But we also saw an increase in or decrease in production because of that lower acres that, uh, from the acreage report a few weeks ago. So is any of that uh, bullish for the market? Slightly, but again, it's, it, none of it was too far out of the range of expectations. So while those numbers in and of themselves would be bullish, it was pretty well already built into the market. So what kind of price picture might we see rest of July and into August as far as corn? Well, the, the big thing to watch for uh, going forward is July makes up about 90% of the yield, the weather in July does. So, um, so far we've seen good weather across the Corn Belt and, and so it looks like we could have a good corn crop. So the rest of this month is really going to kind of determine what prices look, look like going into harvest time. All right, let's shift over to soybeans. Uh, what kind of new crop outlook are they projecting? Well, they um, increased our production for soybeans. We had a few more acres. They didn't really do anything with the yield. And then um, we're also, we also saw some changes in um, our, our, our other, other balance sheet. Uh, crush has been strong. Exports have been strong as well. And so will price very briefly likely change much as far as the soybeans? Uh, kind of with corn, it's, it's really hard to tell. Um, we've seen a little bit of drying out in, in the corn belt, and so we might see a few more late acres of soybeans go in. Um, and then the growing conditions seem to be fairly good. So it's really, you know, we'll have to watch the weather and see how it goes. Back to trivia to wrap things up for this week. Our right answer is C. Usually eight nails are put into a horseshoe. Have you ever thought of a forest as a farm field? Well, that surprising observation came from the subject of today's feature story. Jason Smith of Brookhaven is the outgoing Mississippi Forestry Association Outstanding Logger of the Year. The young businessman has already built a reputation for conservation, safety, generosity, and service to the logging industry. I'm just a name, my guys that's out here with me, that's uh, Jason Smith Logan. It was probably inevitable Jason Smith of Brookhaven, Mississippi would own his own logging business. The third generation logger grew up surrounded by grandparents, parents, uncles, and cousins in the logging industry. 
As a result, at the age of 36, he has more experience and expertise than his youth might imply. He's worked full-time in logging since 1998. Smith worked with his father, Jimmy, and for four years, co-owned the JS Timber Company with him. With his father looking toward retirement, Smith formed his own company in 2011. There's a lot of good loggers in the southwest part of Mississippi, and uh, the thing that kind of stood out to, to us is he's just a man of character and integrity, and he enjoys what he does, and he's real passionate about it. Those who know Smith say one of his strongest attributes is you can trust him to take care of the land. Smith cuts for Resource Management Service of Birmingham, Alabama. When Smith harvests a property, RMS says you know he will exceed the requirements of the best management practices for forestry. Smith is also trained in the Sustainable Forestry Initiative. That's one thing about Jason. When you're done, it's kind of what you see out here today. Uh, the place is certainly going to be in better shape than it was when he got here. It's going to be clean. Uh, if you look around, the, just the landscape of his log jobs, everything's cut down, it's clean, it's kind of to the ground. Uh, his dozer work is impeccable, he goes above and beyond. Jason Smith logging is known for its safety. His seven-man crew has had no lost time accidents since the company started in 2011. Rather than conducting safety training himself, Smith carries his commitment one step further. He pays an outside company to do it. Southern Safety Solutions started this. We, we got on board right when he started doing it just so we would be sure we would, would have our safety meetings once a month. And I mean, he comes out, he schedules it, and he documents it. And plus we get an hour of continuing education when he does come out and do that. And at the end of the day, he wants everybody to return home and to be safe so they can get back home with their wife and kids. And that's the most important thing that he emphasizes to his crew on a daily basis. One of Smith's top priorities is his family. He and his wife Kayla have four sons. She keeps the books for the company. Kayla and Jason are also active supporters of the Mississippi logging industry. Jason has served in the past as the president of the Mississippi Loggers Association. He is presently the vice president of the Southwest District of the MLA. Kayla serves as the district's secretary. The Smith family is very active in MLA's Log a Load for Kids program. Jason's mother, Ann, was one of the founding members of the state Log a Load for Kids committee when the MLA joined this nationwide effort in 1994. Through auctions and other fundraising events, the MLA has donated a total of $1.1 million to the Children's Hospital at the University of Mississippi Medical Center in Jackson. Unfortunately, Ann Smith passed away in 2007, but the family's commitment to log a load for kids hasn't diminished. Right when that was getting started in the mid-90s, uh, my mama, she was one of the founding members. That's kind of a thing that drives us now. The Smith family and logging are practically synonymous in southwest Mississippi. Jason's grandfather, Paul B. Smith, and his grandmother, Wessie, started the family's logging heritage when he returned from World War II. Paul B. Smith's three sons, including Jason's father, Jimmy, became loggers. Jason and his two brothers have their own logging companies. When it comes to awards, the Smiths are well represented. Jason's cousin, Jeff Lee, was MFA Logger of the Year in 2001. Jason's father was the 2004 MLA Logger of the Year. His uncle, Curtis Smith, was the MFA Logger of the Year in 2006. His brother, Brad, was honored with the title in 2008. His brother, Lance, was the Lincoln County Forestry Association's Logger of the Year in 2003. It took hard work and flexibility for Jason Smith to get through the recession. He harvested for companies and private landowners. Most people don't realize logging companies are just like businesses you find on a city street. Smith estimates he has at least a million and a half dollars worth of equipment. He tries to replace a major piece every year. Smith also keeps backup equipment so if something breaks, the crew can continue to work. With expenses like these, downtime is costly. If diesel is $3.35 a gallon, Smith pays about $2,000 a day. Our average fuel consumption a day is uh, 600 gallons or more just on a small operation. 
Smith says logging sites can appear ugly to the uninitiated, but when harvested properly and replanted, forestry is sustainable. People see a logging job and they say, oh, look how bad that looks. But if they go by a field, a field that's being farmed, they, they don't think no different. We own the same conditions as a farmer. Ours is in a 30-year rotation instead of a one-year rotation. And you can watch the story again on Jason Smith on our Farm Week website, our Facebook page, or YouTube. Our website address, farmweek.msucares.com. You can also find our fan page at facebook.com slash farmweekusa. Talk to Jason, he's doing well, but back when it was so wet in the early spring, mm. there was a point two weeks they didn't work. So wow. the, the vagaries of weather in the logging business. Mm. Well, we are at the end of Farm Week uh, for this week. On our next show, it's getting dry and hot in Mississippi, but it's been that way for years in California. There has been more rain this summer in the West, but California continues to suffer through its record drought. In the food factor, olive oil, Natasha will clear away some of the confusion regarding the different kinds. And in Southern Gardening, the Profusion Zinnia, this Mississippi Medallion Award winner performs well in hot, humid conditions. For the rest of the Vomit crew, I'm Artis Ford. And I'm Leighton Spann. Thanks for watching. We'll see you next week.